Very good afternoon to everyone present here. A very warm welcome. This is Tanvi. On behalf of our Optum iBits team, I would like to welcome you all to our iBits e-learning session. A brief introduction about our program. The iBits e-learning session is initiated by for Optum iBits e-learning and it is an interactive program where we discuss optometric topics. Today, we have Mr. Saujanya Mondal who will be talking about fitting rose key contact lenses. So before we start off, I would like to give a brief introduction about our speaker today. Mr. Saujanya has done Bachelor of Optometry from West Bengal University of Technology and holds a Master in Optometry from Amity University, India. Presently working, op presently working at Optocyte Eye Care uh, in Assam as a specialty contact lens consultant. He has also done his fellowship from LVP Hyderabad. He has worked as an assistant professor in Amity University, Department of Optometry and Vision Science, and also worked as a faculty optometrist and optometry in charge at School of Optometry, Sri Shankar Deva Netralya, Guwahati, Assam, and played a pivotal role in establishing Ridley College of Optometry in Assam. He has also worked as a head of department come specialty contact lens and low vision consultant at, low, at Ridley College of Optometry associated with Chandra Prabhu Eye Hospital. We welcome you to the session, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, that uh, brief and long, uh, I'd like to tell that, that it's, it was kind of a long introduction. So uh, we'll like to discuss about the Roske family of lenses. So how do we start the fitting and all? and how do we select our patients and what all things we must look into while fitting in this kind of specialty lenses. So mostly I hope uh, since I got to learn that uh, previous lectures has already been taken on scleral lenses and uh, since scleral lens is also a type of lens which is generally used for or which is generally fitted in cases of keratogonus or irregular and in case of post-surgical cornea. So Roske is also one of them. So uh, first, uh, let us talk about the CLEC study. So what is the CLEC study? This study observed around 1,000, around 1,200 patients with keratogonus over a five years period. The study looked at factors which might predict the corneal scarring. It showed factors such as the steepest baseline corneal curvatures, marked corneal staining, and that at an age of 20 years were predictive of a development of corneal scarring. It, the main important point is that it concluded that poor fitting contact lenses increase the risk of scarring more than two folds. So the main thing is that we should fit the contact lenses properly and we should select the correct type of contact lenses in specific type of patients. Now uh, looking into the RGP design, uh, as you can see the normal cornea, the average AEL, AEL stands for axial edge, edge lift. So uh, the AEL is 0 0.07. So the optic zone is large and the average diameter is approximately 9.2 millimeters. But in case of irregular corneas, things are very much different. Here the AEL varies from 0 0.10 to 0 0.40. So the small conical optic zone for the keratoconus. So in that case, what or the main thing in case of a rose scale lens is that the design specification as if you compare it with an RGP lens is that in case of a rose scale lens, it has a very small back optic zone diameter, which is not the case with general or normal RGP lens design. So uh, uh, as you can see, it is absolutely essential to use the correct design as I already told. Keratoconus designs must be used for keratoconus. The proper design should be given or selected in case of proper or exact keratoconus patients. Now, regular RGP designs will not accommodate the dramatic change in the radius from the central to the peripheral corneas. So in that cases, we generally, we need to fit row scale lenses and never go to an RGP design. Whereas if you can, uh, if you can uh, see that uh, in other words, a row scale lens is also a RGP lens only, but it's a modified RGP lens. Now, if you go into the Roske designs, there are actually five Roske designs, but as you can see in the, in the, in the presentation, I have mentioned four because the other Roske design is a semi-scleral lens, which is called as uh, Roske to Excel. 
but we are not going to talk on the excel lenses or the semi scleral lenses so i strictly i have kept my topics on mostly the roseke lenses and not the semi scleral lens the roseke also has a semi scleral lens it's called as a roseke 2 xl now if you see the roseke 2 there are generally four we will discuss mainly the four designs the one of the design is a roseke 2 the next one is a roseke 2 nc or which is also called as roseke to nipple cone the other one is roseke to ic or irregular cornea and the last one or the fourth one is the roseke to post graft so the primary applications of roseke to is uh, generally it can be used for oval keratoconus or dimple keratoconus and in case of roseke to nc it is mostly into the steeper nipple cones ic is mainly used for pmd that is pellucid marginal degeneration keratoglobus lasik induced ectasias and the post graft and for the post graft is specifically it is it is used for the patients who have undergone penetrating keratoplasty or pk secondary applications in case of roseke 2 is uh, is pmd whereas roseke 2 nc is all nipple cones roseke 2 ic is oval keratoconus whereas roseke 2 post graft is oval keratoconus now these are some of the parameters that are available which you will get in the in the trial set and uh, as you can see the base curve available in case of roseke 2 is 4.3 to 8.6 mm diameter is about 7.9 mm to 10.4 mm power is generally any edge lift is this generally you'll get it in standard standard flat standard steep now what is this edge lift we'll discuss in the later slides now roseke 2 nc if you can see the base curve available is again 4.3 mm to 7.70 mm diameter is 7.6 mm to 9 mm in case of roseke to ic base curve available is 5.7 to 9.3 diameter as you can see as compared to the roseke 2 and the roseke to nc the diameter available are larger diameters generally it will be in between 9.4 to 12 mm in case of pg or the post graft the base curve available is 5.7 to 9.3 and the diameter available is 9.4 mm to 12 mm now the first step in uh, as i i think you all should be knowing that the first step in fitting any kind of irregular cornea is, is you should have a proper topographer with you though we still we, we still can fit uh, specialty lenses without a topographer but you should in that case you should be having a keratometer but the best thing is uh, if you have a topographer of a or a topography reading of a patient then it will be the best thing now as you can see in the slide in case of large oval cones we should we generally looking at the graph we generally select tend to select the kind of lens or the type of lens that is type of roseke lens that is required in case of large oval cones we can go for roseke to kc with large diameters whereas as you can see in the second one this is a nipple cone uh, the hot as you if you, i hope everyone knows how to read the the topography readings because the hotter or the warmer colors they'll indicate the steeper areas of the cornea whereas the flatter or the cool colors they'll represent the 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 flatter areas of the cornea whereas the warmer colors will will generally will give you the steeper areas of the cornea so uh, small nipple cones as you can see we can go for roseke to nc that is the second case in third cases as you can see this is a is a classical pmd uh, where you can go for roseke to ic or you can also go for a roseke to xl which is the semi scleral lens but uh, as i told you we won't be discussing about the xl lenses so uh, again in, if it is a keratoglobus you can see that we can uh, we can go for roseke to ic and lasik induced ectasias in this case it's better we select the post graft or we can go for ic also the post graft as you can see if we compare with with the other topography readings in the post graft case you can see there is a big central flattening as compared to the periphery because that is what we get in case of a last post lasik patients so as you can see these are the five designs available we already discussed about that now just uh, we should go these are the uh, discussed directly let us discuss about the fitting systems or generally there are five steps of fitting system initially the first one is the central fit in case of once you once we start fitting the roseke lenses the first thing that you should see is the central fit then we'll go into the peripheral fit then we'll go into the overall diameter then the location of the lens followed by the lens movement 
so uh, we also tend this is i uh, because there are generally two types of fitting system we generally see one is a static fitting and the other one uh, we generally put a in one case we don't use a fluorescent in the other case we will use a fluorescent and we'll try to see the fitting patterns so uh, in the fitting patterns initially as i told you we'll start with the with the uh, central fit so what we'll see in the central fit is that <coughs> Yes, so in the central fit KC design, how to select the central base curve? That is what I will be talking about. So, so for example, if the average key is 1.7.1 and flatter, how do we, do we select the average case? Generally, if we do the keratometry readings, we'll get, get the K1 and the K2. So uh, in that case, uh, we'll take the average key. Now, if the average key is 7.1 or flatter than 7.1, then we choose the first trial lens 0.20 millimeters steeper than the average of the two meridians that is steeper than the average k let us take one example of it now if the one of the if the k1 is for example is 7.8 k2 is 7 then the average is around 7.4 so in that case what we'll do is since 7.4 uh, will follow the criteria as the average k is 7.1 and flatter so this will fall in this criteria so what we'll do is will take 0.2 millimeters steeper than the average k so that is 7.20 so your starting first lens that you'll select from the trial set will be 7.20 base curve now if the average keys are between 6 to 7 millimeters we choose the first lens as based on our average k only that is for example if one of the k's is 7.2 the other k is 6.4 the average is 6.8 so in that case, the first trial lens will select as 6.8 only. Now, if the average case are 5.9 and steeper, which is a, for example, these, this is the case where the cornea is very, very steep, actually. Now, in this cases, it's generally very, very unpredictable. But still, we have a rule for that also. We can choose the first trial lens 0 0.40 flatter than the average case. So uh, let us take that uh, one example as uh, 6.2 as one of the case, the other case 5.2 and the average of these two is 5.7. So the first trial lens that we should select is uh, 6.10. Now again, now as you can see, last I have put an important, very important point that is this is only a guide as it will as it measures only the central three millimeters along the line of sight. So generally what we do is this is generally just a guide for starting your first trial. Now, once you put the lens, we see, we see the fitting and based on that fitting, we'll have to decide whether to go flatter or whether to go steeper on that. So that mainly we'll see with the static fitting as well as with the dynamic fitting. Now, for example, just, this is just the fit with the lens centered. We'll all, we should always judge the lens when the patient is actually looking straight and when the lens is centralized. As you can see, this is almost kind of a optimum fit. Now in the optimum fit, we generally uh, see the periphery, we see the central. Now, since we are talking about the central fit, you can see that there is a slight apical touch or a feathery touch in the center, followed by a mid peripheral pooling. Now, we are, we are not concerned about the periphery at present. Let us just concentrate on the center. So as you can see in the center, there is a mild feathery touch in the center followed by a, by a ring of pooling around that. That is called as a light apical touch. Now, in that case, suppose you have taken one, uh, you have started with one of the base curves and you put the lens in the patient's eye and you have seen that, you're seeing that the first lens is, is very steep. As we all know that uh, if there is a central large pooling, as you can see here, there is a very big pooling around in the center so it is a steep lens will go a little bit flatter once we achieve the central minimal touch and then we can achieve the central uh, optimal fit in the center so this is how we we do the central fitting <coughs> now if fluorescent uh, let us start this video yeah if fluorescent flushes over the steepest point on the cornea on blinking then the corneal epithelial erosion is most unlikely. So uh, 20 microns fluorescent is required for the fluorescein. So uh, 
in the center there should be a clearance what we call it as now the tips uh, for the center fit is patient must be looking straight ahead lens must be centralized just the fluorescent flat pattern directly after the blink this is very important ideal if patient's head position is natural we can use a button lamp also now slit lamp essential to judge the final fit it is very uh, it's it's very essential to use a slit lamp along with the along with the cobalt blue filter and uh, it's very it's, it's necessary if you have a rattan filter then you'll get a very good contrast now blue filter allows better assessment of the fluorescence as i already told allow the lens to settle for at least 1 minute so generally what we do is just put the lens allow the lens to settle for 1 minute see the central fitting and uh, followed by the other fitting criteria also uh, like the peripheral fit and all that and then again wait for about half an hour and then again see the fitting or the fluorescence pattern now the trial lens will always that is what the the trial lens will always settle further back onto the cornea the longer it is left on the eye only assess the fluorescent pattern when the lens is located centrally this is very very important now often have to accept more touch in the steeper basis to achieve a satisfactory vision let's not uh, talk about this we'll discuss about that later on now the tips for central fit and again is very very important is to avoid epithelial staining because if we if there is an epithelial staining then obviously it will lead to more and more of scarring now must address this separately that is uh, you must uh, address the central fit separately as well as the peripheral fit which is also some refer to as an edge lift now uh, you should always assess that both of this or this separate uh, like the central fit separately as well as the peripheral fit separately now let us see what we should look into the periphery or the peripheral fit now in the periphery as you can see uh, in case of rose k2 or rose k rose k lenses 85% of all rose k2 and rose k lenses utilize either the standard or the standard flat or standard steep edge lift values now as you can see over here generally whenever you'll fit that uh, fit a trial lens the generally the trial lens will come in a standard lift now standard based on the fitting criteria once you have seen the fitting uh, you can increase the lift or you can decrease the lift also means you can go little bit flatter or you can go little bit steeper now how much steep or flat you want to go there is a generally a standard scale for that for example standard lift is 0.0 now if you want to steepen your lift you can go minus 5 you can go up to minus 1.1.3 also if you want to flatten the curvature flatten the periphery sorry not the curvature if you want to flatten the periphery then uh, you'll have to go in the plus that is plus one and you can flatten it till uh, plus three so depending on the amount of fluorescence in the periphery you'll decide whether to go for a flatten plus three or to go for a, a steeper periphery edge lift like minus 0.5 or minus one or minus 1.3 Now edge lift, uh, generally the ideal edge lift is uh, the fluorescent bandwidth at the edge is 0.6 millimeter to 0.8 millimeter wide. Now judge the lift at generally, generally we, what we do is that we tend to judge the lift at mostly the three and nine o'clock position or adjacent to the cone apex. But again, you should keep in mind that the lens must be centralized. <clears throat> ideal peripheral fit, as you can see, a very good band at the periphery. You can also see in the video. Now, yeah, peripheral fit edge lift system. Now, as you can see in the first, uh, this picture, you can see that there is a very excessive amount of edge lift. So, uh, we'll have to steepen the, the edge lift or we can steepen the periphery. So, in, in, the, in the second case, what is that? The edge is very tight. So what we'll need to do is that we need to flatten the, the periphery over here. Now this is complete uh, as, I, as we have already discussed is, for example, the standard lift is 0.0. .0. You can see in the picture. Now, in case of, suppose you want to go from the standard, you want, if you're going towards the, the <coughs> excuse me, if you are going towards the like 0 0.1 so as you can see 
it will flatten the periphery is flattening the more again one is flat again if you go 1.3 it is again very much flat <coughs> whereas in case of uh, in case of uh, the flatter periphery excuse me yeah now again uh, depending upon the situation is uh, for example as we have uh, discussed is uh, in the periphery you need to increase or flatten the periphery or you need to decrease the the or you can uh, steepen the periphery now for example if if this is the situation over here where you can see there is no at all edge clearance you can see that last one is there is no at all edge clearance so what in that case what you need to do is that you need to flatten the edge lift actually so in this case you'll have to flatten the edge lift and uh, mean if you if you ask me then i'll order with the with plus 3 whereas if you see the last case here you'll see that there is an excessive edge clearance at the periphery here what we need to do is that we need to steepen the periphery and we need to go minus 1.3 so in that way the picture has been given okay so for example if if you see this picture in here there is also an excessive edge clearance so what we need to do is that we need to tuck in the periphery or uh, steepen the edge lift so how much edge lift will will steepen is like we'll have to order it in minus 1 so when we will order it that from the company when the order will come the lens will come in minus 1 edge okay <clears throat> now the peripheral fit is edge lift system is always judge edge lift in the horizontal meridian and uh, for example if you take the first picture you can see it's it's very tight so what we need how do you, how am i telling that it is very tight because there is no fluorescence at the periphery so if there is no fluorescence in the periphery what will happen is that the tears there is no there will be no tear circulation okay so in that case what we need to do is that we need to go flatter so if you see again uh, in this the center picture is the optimal fit that is around 0.6 to 0.8 mm of edge clearance but again if you see the last picture it is again uh, it is very loose lens why loose lens because again the edge clearance is too much so what we need to do is that here we need to tuck in the periphery so in the first case as you can see that there we need to flatten the periphery in the last picture as you can see here we need to steep in the periphery this is again standard edge lift trial lens showing that here again if you see the first picture though the picture is a little bit blurred but as you can see here the periphery is again as we can see horizontally it is very the edge clearance is very thin it is very minimal edge clearance is there so what we need to do is we need to flatten the edge lift here how much flattening will do will generally will lift will give a lift or will flatten the edge lift to 1.3 increase lift now generally these are the tips for peripheral fit the first thing is lens must be centralized so uh, use the lids to centralize the lens patient must be looking directly ahead if lift different on temporal and nasal side average this a tight edge is more comfortable obviously patient will if you ask the patient so generally we generally don't ask the patient but if you ask the patient the patient will always judge a tighter edge lens more comfortable as compared to a loose edge lens optimal edge lift gives a better location of the lens edge lift generally controls the movement if there is excessive edge lift what will happen is that because of the lid because of the blinking action the lens will move more now peripheral fit is more important than the central fit because that decides the movement now when in when in doubt too much is better generally we do not go for too much of edge clearance but we try to keep it on the optimal side now the next uh, uh, thing that we'll uh, we'll see in the fitting system is that the next step is the overall diameter of the lens because we shouldn't go for an what is very big diameter and again we cannot go for very small diameter now optimal diameter is is what we call it as the gen the lens should hang off the upper eyelids that is what is what we also term it as an upper lens upper edge uh, upper lid fit 
okay so as you can see in this picture this is what we'll call it as the upper lid fit because the upper lid is almost holding the lenses so be well clear of the lower limbus the lens actually shouldn't never should never uh, rest on the limbus and again it should have a very good central location so as you can see over here in the first picture as you can see this is the this is the ideal condition where you can see there is some amount of uh, the upper lid is holding the lens and uh, but in the center one as you can see the, the lens is very small the diameter is very small and uh, uh, in case again if you see the last picture this is again a very large diameter lens so we cannot go for a very large diameter lens we cannot go for a very small diameter lens we should go for an ideal ideal fitting ideal diameter that is the upper lid should hold the lens a bit again this lens as you can see is too large again too large is not good because as you can see the lower edges of the lens is resting on the lower limbus the patient would be very irritating and patient will never be satisfied with this kind of a lens fit again if the lens is very too small for example in this case as you can see in this video that the that the lens is very small it, the diameter is very small so it can lead if the diameter is very small it can lead to 3 and 9 o'clock of 9 o'clock staining now uh, diameter is very very important thing now available diameters are from 7.9 to 11.4 mm now when we you'll buy a trial set rose gate trial set generally you'll get there are different different trial sets as we have discussed previously uh you should generally if you are having the rose k2 design if you have the rose k2 ic design or if you are having the rose k nc design so different uh design lenses will come in different diameter uh, availability in the trial set but can affect the lens can affect the diameter can affect the location as well as the lens movement can affect the tolerance and the stability also uh because as as one in one of the cases as you have seen that the lens was resting on the lower limbus in that case the patient will will not tolerate the lenses and 0.3 mm change can be very significant now large diameters required for early early keratoconus larger cones post graft irregular scarred corneas and wider palpable apertures smaller di diameters are generally required for or uh, generally advised for advanced keratoconus smaller cones and smaller palpable apertures now the larger the area of corneal distortions the larger the lens needs to be because the lens should cover the irregular irregularity now uh, overall diameter again varies with the three rose k lens designs as you uh, as we have already discussed in the trial set if you see in the rose k2 design uh, the standard diameter you'll get it in 8.7 mm whereas in case of if it is a post graft trial set the standard will be 10.4 mm but you can modify it according to your you can customize it so if you want to go for a 12 mm you can you'll have to order the company a 12 mm but generally the the standard trial set that you'll get in that the uh, lens if it is a post graft trial set it will be the standard will be 10.4 whereas the ic design the standard uh, diameter will be 11.4 but if you want to customize it you can customize it from 9.4 to 12 diameter now the now the uh, fourth step in fitting uh, these kind of lenses is the location of the lens uh, as you can see in this sorry as you can see in this uh, video <coughs> now location mainly controlled by varying diameters and edge lift so both things will play a very important role that is the diameter of the lens as well as the edge lift now uh, for example in the first case as you can see um, the lens is this is what is what we call it as a high riding lens again in the second case as you can see this is a low riding lens so patient will won't be comfortable in these kind of fittings like very high riding lenses or very low riding lenses the optiban one is as you can see it is a centered now that is what i was talking about the high riding lens what we need to do is uh, if you get a high riding lens then you need to tighten the edge lift you need to reduce the diameter of the lens a bit and steepen the base curve so for example you have seen the fitting and the fitting you get you, you are getting that the lens is a high riding lens what corrections you need to do you need to reduce the edge lift uh sorry i you need to uh, tighten the edge lift you need to reduce the total diameter of the lens you need to steepen the base curve a bit 
Now if you get a roll, low riding lens like this, what we need to do is we need to increase the edge lift, we need to increase the diameter of the lens because once we, uh, once we uh, increase the diameter of the lens, the upper lid will hold the lenses and then you'll get a upper lid fit lens. Uh, uh, next is uh, flatten the base curve and uh, if there is any astigmatism, you should ob obviously address that amount of astigmatism. The last uh, step in the fitting system is the lens movement. So, uh, so again, as you can see, the movement mainly controlled by the edge lift. Now, uh, as I have already told previously in my presentation, that uh, the more the edge lift, the more the movement will be, because the more the patient will blink, the edges will get in contact with the with the with the lids and you'll get an excessive amount of movement. Now optimal it, lens movement is uh, one millimeter to two millimeters on post blink or on blink. So most because blinking because this amount of movement is required for tear exchange. Now as you can see in this case, the first case was an optimal uh, as you can see uh, in the second case the edge lift, if you can see, the edge lift is, is very tight. In the first case, the edge lift was very optimal edge lift because you can see a nice band around 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 millimeters of edge lift in the, in the first case. But in the second case, you can see that the edge lift or the edge clearance is very thin. Okay, so the lens is actually, what is happening, the lens is actually tightly sitting on the cornea. So the movement is very less. Now that the other, one more other uh, technology that is there, this is called as an ACT technology or asymmetric corneal technology. Now in the trial set, the standard trial set that you'll get in that standard trial set, you won't be getting any ACT lenses, but you can customize the lenses and you can get it in your uh, ACT designs. Now what ACT is, is actually uh, generally we, if in the fitting, we get an excessive amount of edge clearance in the six o'clock position like not exactly six o'clock, you can call it as from five o'clock position to seven o'clock position. In that area, if you're getting excessive amount of edge clearance and whole other, other edges are absolutely fine. For example, the three o'clock is fine, the nine o'clock is fine, the 12 o'clock position is fine. So uh, in that cases, what we need to do is that we, in this kind of, in specifically in row scale lenses, what we can do is that we can tuck in the six o'clock position on, only. So this is possible only this kind of technology is only available in Roske lenses. Now uh, it is available for all Rose, all Roske 2 uh, intralimbal designs. Now only the inferior quadrant is steepened. How much amount of steepening is required is it will depend upon the practitioner. Now this will give a pro it will provide the better comfort in same in some cases it also improves the equity also. Now, how do we, there are generally three grades, like you can order it in a grade one, grade two, and grade three. For example, if in the first case, as you can see, in, in the, uh, for example, in the five o'clock to seven o'clock position, if you can see the edge clearance is, is more, edge clearance is more as if you compare it with the three o'clock and nine o'clock position. So in this case, what we can do is we can opt for an ACT technology. And if you order the lenses, we'll have to order the lenses in ACT grade one. So once the lens, lens will come in ACT grade one, there will be a grade one tucking. Okay. So uh, in the second case, if you can see in the second case, again, the, the 12 o'clock position, the three o'clock position, the nine o'clock, like from three o nine o'clock to three o'clock position, this position is the edge lift is, is good actually. But if you see the six o'clock position, there is too much of edge clearance. So in that case, you'll have to opt for a ACT grade two. Now, for example, if you see again, the third case, there is so such an amount of uh, edge lift that there is a bubble almost. The lens is not only sitting, the lens is not actually sitting on the, on the cornea actually, in the edges. It is actually, there is a big amount of lift. So we, we need to go for a ACT grade three, where we'll get in only the rest of the design will be the same only the design at the three the nine o'clock the sorry the six o'clock position will get it tucked in there and that is what is called as an act or asymmetric corneal technology
Now, this will completely depend upon the practitioner because the practitioner has to decide depending upon the fluorescent pattern that whether he needs to go for an ACT grade one or an ACT grade two or an ACT grade three. Now, the most com uh, common reasons for poor tolerance or the failure in the fitting is edge lift insufficient, ignored corneal, for example, if you have ignored the corneal astigmatism. Now, uh, reluctance to try piggyback. Uh, I hope everyone knows what is a piggybacking of contact lenses. Generally, there are you can piggyback a, a RGP lens over a soft lens. The, in that case, in that specific cases, we can do a piggybacking with a rose scale lens also. Like we initially, we the first lens that we will put on the cornea is a soft lens, and mostly we use a daily disposable lens. And over that, you can put the rose scale lens. That is what, what is called as a piggybacking, but there is a reverse piggybacking is also available. Let's, let's not discuss about the reverse piggybacking technique. And uh, reluctance to try corneal scleral lenses or the XL design. Reluctance to vary the overall diameter. And if the lens is of incorrect design, and also if the lens is maintained very poorly. Now, uh, in summary, to maximize the success using the Roske fitting system is evaluate the edge lift carefully, which is very important. Do not ignore corneal astigmatism. Use piggyback very aggressively, sometimes temporarily, initially to get the patient adjusted to the lenses. <clears throat> Assess and vary the overall diameter. Depending upon, it again depends upon the, upon the practitioner. He should decide whether to reduce the diameter or to increase the diameter. Emphasize the patient's role in lens care maintenance and checkup. It's not only like you give, you have done a good, very good fitting. You have dispensed the lenses properly to the patient, but you didn't call the patient for a follow up. In that case, generally, you'll, the patient, you'll generally lose that kind of patients and the patient will never be, never be uh, very happy with the maintenance. So generally, it's very, it's advised that uh, you should always ask the patient to come for a follow up because in the follow up, we need to see whether the patient is using the lenses properly, whether he is maintaining the lenses properly. Again, actively, if the patient is having or has developed any allergies, so you should, that also should be controlled. Take time on the initial evaluation and follow up visits to motivate and get close to your patients. Now, uh, one of the very important things in, fish, in uh, fitting uh, specialty lenses is that what I have seen in my practice is uh, generally you never lose a specialty lens patient. Because uh, I'll just tell one uh, example. Uh, one of my patients, uh, initial patients, when I was working in Assam in Chandrababai Hospital, so uh, one of my patients, I have given the patients uh, rose scale lenses, and the, and uh, then after that, because after some time I shifted to uh, Gurgaon, where I was in Amity University, I was uh, teaching there. So the patient actually called me up. That was almost uh, generally the patient used to get the follow-ups means take advice over phone and like that. So once the patient called me up and he told that, uh, sir, I want to uh, get a follow-up done. I think I'm not very much comfortable with the lenses and it's almost been two years and I think the lens has to be replaced. So sir, uh, how we can do it? So I told that, see, I, at present I'm in very in Gurgaon and uh, in the coming one or two months, I'm not planning to visit Assam. So the patient actually came to Gurgaon and uh, got the, got the checkup done and I had replaced that lenses and uh, the patient was very happy. So why I took this example is because in such kind of patients in, in specialty lens fitting, you never lose a patient. And uh, in the other most important thing is that uh, the follow-ups. If you keep the proper follow-up, you can track the patient properly and the patient, you'll never lose that patient. <clears throat> And obviously, in any kind of uh, lens dispensing, whether it is a soft lens or an RGP lens or a scleral lens or a rose scale lens, care, lens care and maintenance is very, very important. Now, uh, you can use a multipurpose RGP solutions, uh, like there are various RGP lens solutions available in the market. Weekly cleaning with intensive cleaner, which is generally alcohol based for cleaning bound deposits especially formulated for care and maintenance of rose scale lenses. Now, uh, there are certain solutions that are available, which are specifically for rose scale lenses. With each order of rose scale lens, a free starters pack with storage lens case will be provided. That generally comes, as you can see in the picture, with the, with the starter kit, you'll get a lens case and also you'll get a, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, 
uh, a starter kit you'll get the starter kit uh, you'll get the solution and uh, you'll get the lens case to store the lenses and always there is a very important thing is you should ask the patient to change the lens cases also because most of the time once we get such kind of i have seen many patients coming to our clinic where the lens cases are are so dirty that you will not feel like touching the lens case at all so advise the patient that to clean it very properly and uh, it's better that you ask the patient to change the lens case if possible every month now please spend time to explain to your patient the importance of lens care and distance section for good eye health that is very very important and uh, it is uh, because of, because uh, if the lens if you if the patient maintains the lenses properly the patient will be satisfied with that lenses also if he is not maintaining that lenses then the patient will it may tend to get infections and with that infections the patient slowly slowly you lose that patient now again weekly cleaning is very important once a week clean the lenses with an intensive base cleaner and rinse with saline to remove any kind of deposits uh, enzymatic protein table tablets can be used once or twice a week use a progen this generally comes from manicon you can you can get it from manicon for severe uh, depositions so once in 3 to 3 or 6 months now as you can see uh, cleaning with progen is before it is like it was like that after cleaning with progen it has become absolutely clear of any kind of deposits so your challenge is so why should we consider fitting irregular corneas it's uh, the most important point is personal satisfaction and again this will become your practice builder and patient loyalty as i had told you with an example that the patients generally these kind of patients irregular corneal patients are very much loyal and uh, and uh, they'll you'll never lose such kind of patients so make a difference to this patient's lives and yours because in in case of any irregular patients you cannot give a potential very good vision with a with a spectacles it's not possible to give give uh, Uh, even 90% of the vision with a with a proper corrected spectacles but you can give approximately almost 100% of the vision if not 100% at least you will be able to give a very good uh, visual equity also along with a very good contrast to the patient now most of the time what happens is uh, in case of irregular corneas the patient it's less of visual equity problem uh, though there are visual equity problems but less of visual equity problem and more of of blurring images or or spreading of of any kind of images which generally happens because of excessive amount of abrasions to the patient now these abrasions are very difficult to control with you cannot control the uh, the abrasions with with the spectacles with a normal pair of spectacles but which can be controlled with a with a specialty lenses now uh, you can make a difference to the patient lives and also yours now these are the published works of obviously we all know uh, dr paul rose and uh, obviously on file these are the david thomas contact lens limited dtcl previously i was a educator for rose care lenses so uh, at present generally I'm not into the educator as a rose care lenses educator but i am still into practice and i practice in rose care lenses regularly thank you do i i know i have finished the topic very early but i am open for any kind of question and answers thank you thank you sir that was really informative and i hope our audience also enjoyed it so let's move on to the question and answer session so the first question is from uh, monil he asks uh, what is the difference in a uh, design between rose k2 ic and rose k post graft as in the parameters are the same okay the difference between rose k2 ic and a post graft is in the post graft you'll see because the post graft patients uh, in the in case of any kind of post graft patients uh, what happens is the central cornea is very much flattened as compared to the to the periphery so these kind of specific post graft designs if you hold the lenses only you'll understand the center is little bit flattened as compared to the periphery because you cannot fit a normal ic design uh, in case of a post graft because in if you do so what happen will what will happen is that you'll get a big amount of central pooling i hope that uh, that clears the doubt 
Thank you, sir. So the next question is from the same uh, person, Mr. Monil. So he asks, uh, how tight peripheral fit is comfortable? Will it cause any impigment or cause any discomfort to the eye? See, uh, the main uh, discomfort to the eye in the sense patient will be generally very much comfortable with a tighter edge. But the problem is that there will be no uh, tear exchange. And we all know if there is no tear exchange, what will happen to the cornea? I hope that clears the doubt. And as I told that what the optimal amount of edge clearance that is required is 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 millimeter of edge clearance. Thank you, sir. Moving on. Uh, we have Mr. Puram. He asks, uh, for post graph patients, should we, uh, should we be expected any ideal lens movement with the trial lens? With the trial lens, ideal lens movement? Yeah, with the trial lens for post graph patients. Okay. Now for the post graph patients, ideal movement is generally it will again depend upon patient to patient. It varies a lot actually because uh, uh, how much is lens movement is generally required. It will, it will, it needs a little bit of uh, lens fitting experience. Uh, I'd rather say that because there is again, in case of post graphs, it's, it's very again, unpredictable thing because uh, we cannot give more amount of movement. Again, we cannot give very less amount of movement in that case. So it will depend upon case to case and it will depend upon the experience of the practitioners to judge how much amount of movement to be given. Hello? 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 Yes, sir. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah. Is yeah. It? yeah. So these are the questions only. These were the three questions. So right. I think we can wrap up the session here. Right. So thank you so much. We have wrapped up the session for today. So on behalf of IBITS and our audience, I would like to thank our speaker, Mr. Sarjanya for uh, giving us such an informative and interactive uh, presentation. It was a very, very valuable presentation. And I hope our uh, viewers also found it very informative. So, sir, I would like to have a few words from you, like a feedback, if you can. Uh, see, as a, as a feedback, so these kind of uh, online sessions are, are very important, actually. Uh, uh, looking into the present scenario, what is happening. So uh, these online lectures will give lot, lot of inter these kind of interactive sessions will will give lot of uh, uh, experience uh, for in that way because uh, since I have put all the videos and all that, so uh, these videos are actually live videos that we have taken in case of patients, and uh, so at least uh, for the students and all, since the practice experience practitioners they are already uh, very much into the fitting those lenses. Now, mainly for the students, they'll get an idea about what is what is central fit, what is a peripheral fit. So it's uh, so these kind of sessions are it, it really makes a very big difference. And uh, since uh, and they can take this experience and uh, put it in their practice when they'll they'll start practicing these kind of lenses. Thank and uh, thank you all uh, for for uh, asking me for inviting me into this session. Uh, thank you all. Thank you so much, sir. It was a great pleasure having you here. So that brings us to the end of the, today's program. Thanks to our audience for especially being so interactive, supportive, and patient today. On that note, I would like to end the meeting. So this session will be on YouTube soon. So stay tuned for more sessions by IBITS for Optom. You can also visit us at www.foroptom.com for more info on IBITS e-learning sessions. Also, join us on social media, WhatsApp, Facebook, and Instagram. Until then, stay home, stay safe, and have a great week ahead. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.